So the title of our third session in our study on the Gospel of Luke is Sacrament and the Life of Jesus. As you can see, I'm standing here in our sanctuary in front of an altar with an empty chalice and paten and next to our baptismal font for today's lesson. And I hope you've taken some time to read through the two readings for today already from Luke chapter 3 and chapter 22. That's the baptism of Jesus as well as the Last Supper. If you haven't yet, as usual, I'd like to ask you to pause this video and take some time to do that before you, you pick back up with us again. Now, one of the things that I want to notice with you about these two passages is the way that they bookend Jesus's public ministry in Luke and in all of the Synoptic Gospels. In fact, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of them begin with Jesus's baptism. And especially in Luke, though, before his baptism, Jesus is mostly a passive figure in the gospel. He's someone that's hoped for. He's someone that's spoken of. He's someone that's observed at a distance. But it's fair to say, I think, that, that before Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist is really more the main figure and voice that Luke draws our attention to. But after his baptism... After his baptism, it's all about Jesus. Jesus is front and center, and so there's a real sense in which the baptism scene marks a real before and after moment of transition for the writer of this gospel. And, the, some, and something similar can be said for the Last Supper scene in chapter 22. Jesus' public ministry leads right up to chapter 22. Until that point, He's teaching and speaking in parables and the like, but after the Last Supper, there are no more healings, there are no more signs, except of course for the resurrection itself and the, and the post-resurrection appearances, and there are no more of these other instructional aspects of his life ministry, such as the parables. In Luke, these moments that we Christians reading this would call sacramental are loaded moments. They're transitional moments in the way Jesus' life unfolds in this gospel. And I want to talk today a little bit about how reading this gospel with a recognition of this sacramental feature of Luke's narrative becomes one of the ways in which this book becomes more than just a book, but a key instrument for Christian discipleship as well as a means of grace. Now, on the other hand, you might say, well, of course, Jesus' ministry is bookended by sacraments. That's the way it happened historically. The baptism came first. The Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, excuse me, is last. Why should we attribute any more significance to it beyond that? Well, as you may have started to notice by now, one of the things that I have wanted to do with this study is to lean into those aspects of the gospel where it both leaps off the page into our world as a, as a critical discipleship tool and also pulls us into the story. In other words, I'm having us look at the ways in which the gospel offers itself to us as something that, that grabs us and brings us along on a discipleship journey with Jesus. And one of the ways that it does that is by framing and contextualizing Jesus' life ministry for us as being sacramental in nature. Jesus' life ministry is inaugurated by his baptism, just as the Christian life in general is inaugurated by baptism. Jesus hands over the key to renewing that life sacramentally to the church at the Last Supper, and we as Christians continue to partake in that renewal. So the sacramental context of Jesus' ministry in this gospel is, on one level, a description of what happened historically, but on another level, it's programmatic for us. It helps us to know more fully and richly the true content of this life that we're being sucked into here. This life that begins at baptism and is renewed at the table. One other thing that I want to reflect with you about today along these same lines has to do with the unique and the distinctive character of these sacramental scenes. In each of these two instances, we see 
the very first of these sacraments. Jesus' baptism is the very first true baptism. The Last Supper is the very first Eucharist or communion meal. And because they're the first, and because it's Jesus himself that's involved with them, and also because both of these events are pre-crucifixion and pre-resurrection, there's something about them that is special and distinctive and somewhat unlike the later version of the Christian practice that we carry forward in the church today. In this sense, you might say that the gospel is trying to do two things at once with these sacramental scenes. It's both offering the, the reader and the disciple a way into the life of, the Je uh, of Jesus, the, that is the reader who's, who's holding this gospel and reading it for the purpose of discipleship. But it's also doing another thing. It's also telling us how these sacraments originated, how they came to be what they are today. So let me just briefly also look at what makes each of these passages foundational for the sacraments that ensue from them. As for Jesus' baptism, one of the things that is most clearly called out to our attention in this passage is a transition in the meaning and importance of baptism. John the Baptist's own words in chapter 3, verse 16, call out a difference between John's baptism on the one hand and Jesus's. John's is merely with water. Jesus's is with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's is carried out by a person of lesser standing. He's less powerful than the one who is coming. And we're told earlier that it's primarily a baptism of repentance that he's carrying out. Jesus' baptism is clearly more than that. And what we're witnessing in this scene and meant to understand is that here is the transition from one baptism to the other because even though Jesus is essentially participating in John's baptism here, the heavens open, the Spirit descends, there's a voice from heaven. What this story represents is the way that in Jesus, God has taken John's baptism and made it something else by investing it with new power and significance. I like to say that what's really happening here is that Jesus is baptizing baptism. He's making John's old baptism into Christian baptism. And part of the point here is that this event is unique, not all Christian baptisms are going to be like this one because this is where Jesus made baptism, baptism. So on the one hand, while beginning Jesus' ministry with the baptism has a way of inviting us, the baptized reader, into the story, on the other hand, it's also trying to let us know something about what baptism is and how baptism became what it is. Something similar is true for the Last Supper. It's very clear that this is a Passover meal that Jesus is about to have with his disciples. The meal happens at the Festival of Unleavened Bread on the day when the Passover lamb is supposed to be sacrificed. So, so just like in the case of John's baptism, there's a previously existing practice involved here whose meaning and importance is about to be changed. It's going to become something entirely new because Jesus is about to invest it with new meaning. Instead of looking back into history and focusing on the Passover, though, the message at this table is all about the future. First of all, he tells them that the bread is his body for them and that the contents of the cup represent the new covenant in my blood. So already it's become not as much about what happened during that exodus from Egypt that the Passover normally calls to mind, but what's about to happen in the crucifixion. Also, as he offers the bread and the cup, he himself, you may have noticed, refuses to participate, saying that he won't eat or drink until he can do so when all is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So it's a meal with hope and an expectation attached to it and really infused into it. It's a meal that somehow is never quite finished and especially isn't quite finished here as we read it in Luke. 
So just like with John's baptism, then there are two things that I want to point out to you about the Last Supper scene. First, it's a singular event in one respect. It's the moment when for Christians, the Passover meal becomes the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, which for us replaces and is something different than the Passover. This is the moment when one is made in to the other. It's sacramentalized, you might say. But the second thing we should notice for us, especially as disciple readers, is that is, is the unfinishedness of this meal and, and the projection forward in time to the real meal that this meal anticipates and prepares for is the very same meal that we continue to participate in. We become part of this story because we still share that meal and the unfinished nature of it is usually interpreted by the church in the same sense that it's always a continuation of that same meal it's never it's never a different meal it's the same meal because it's an unfinished meal it's always the same meal in anticipation of and that means that we are still sitting at the table with Jesus and his disciples sharing the bread and the cup, waiting for the day when Jesus will join in with us again. So in closing, today's readings could be viewed as one more layer of the preparation for the gospel that I spoke about in the previous lesson, because the sacramental context of Jesus's ministry is teaching us to see all that's here through a different set of eyes. But in this case, it's not just teaching us to see Jesus, but how to see where you and I enter into this story as well. So switching rooms here on you for the last little bit, I want to put a couple of questions on your mind as you think through this a little bit more in preparation for our Zoom discussion coming up. And the first one is kind of a general question about uh, sacraments in our imagination. And it's how do the sacraments, how does participating in uh, communion, uh, if you can remember your baptism, how does your baptism, how do the sacraments put us in the pages of the gospel? How do the sacraments put us in pages of the gospel when we when we carry uh, out the, the, those, those sacramental acts in worship together? How does that Put us back in the pages of the gospel. The second question is a little bit more, more personal in nature. I'm asking you here to, to think a little bit about your own stories and experiences. When has sacrament brought you back to the life of Jesus? Have you ever had an experience of, of communion, for example, that, that really brought you imaginatively back to that, that scene at the Last Supper? I can think of uh, for me, a couple of Monday Thursday experiences, for example, that really made me feel like I was continuing that meal uh, with those disciples in, in the way that, that I talked about just a few moments ago. And the third and final question that I want you to chew on a little bit has to do with that book ending that I talked about toward the beginning. How might book ending Jesus' ministry with sacraments condition us, the, the disciple reader, to be able to witness the holy in the everyday. How might bookending Jesus' ministry with sacraments condition us to be able to witness the holy in the everyday? So I'll leave you with those three questions to ponder and to chew on and, and to wrestle with in light of the readings for today. And I look forward to, to talking with you in our Zoom discussion. God bless.